Money never sleeps, pal. Hey there, welcome to Money Never Sleeps, a podcast that looks inside the head of entrepreneurs and at what makes them do what they do. I'm Pete Townsend, your co-host of Money Never Sleeps, along with Owen Fitzgerald. We're doing another edition of Money Talks this week, expanding beyond the interview format to cover content from recent talks and features we've done. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is kindly sponsored by Ireland's fintech and financial services recruitment specialists, top-tier recruitment. If you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it is highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at top-tier recruitment. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com and tell them we sent you. In this episode, we bring back Matthew Lamero, the managing partner of Fifth Era and Karetsu Capital, who combined are the most active early-stage venture investors backing almost 200 companies a year. Matthew is also the manager of Blockchain Co-Investors, who are investing in the leading blockchain venture partnerships. We had Matthew on episode 47 previously. We brought him back as he's recently published his 2020 predictions for blockchain, a topic near and dear to my heart and my wallet. We split this one into two parts, given the length of our discussion. So let's get on with part one in this week's episode of Money Never Sleeps. Here we go again. Welcome to Money Never Sleeps. We're recording today from the home studio, and we have Matthew Lamero back on the show today, who's on from San Francisco. Welcome back, Matthew. Uh, great to be with you again, Pete, and thank you very much for having me on your show again. Awesome. Great to have you back. Anyway, when we had you on the show last year, Matthew, we talked about your life's work, the books you wrote with your co-author and life partner, Allison Davis, your role as managing partner of Fifth Era and Karetsu Capital. You now have another project off the ground with Blockchain Co-Investors, uh, and we're going to talk about that today, specifically your top 10 predictions on what to expect in the year 2020 with blockchain technologies. So to kind of dig right in, given that um, since we last spoke, that with blockchain co-investors kind of being um, somewhat new, at least from my perspective, I wasn't aware of it. Could you maybe just tell us a bit about what you're doing with blockchain co-investors and, and where things are headed there? Yes, thanks a lot for asking, Pete. And uh, let me say that it's it's a continuation of our investing strategy in blockchain. So um, we had created the first uh, blockchain venture fund of funds focused on uh, investing in real companies using blockchain technologies in their businesses. And uh, we've now uh, launched a second um, initiative, Blockchain Co-Investors, to essentially open up that strategy for other people. I'm not allowed to talk about the specifics of the fund on a broadcast like this. But what I can tell you is that our goal is to have the largest number of um, blockchain leading blockchain companies uh, in our portfolio. And today we're excited that we are investors in eight of the 15 blockchain unicorns. So we're investors through our strategies in Bitfury, Circle, Coinbase, Definity, Figure, Kraken, Ripple, and a host of other companies. So that's what Blockchain Co-Investors is about. People can, uh, you know, look it up online and find out more about it if they're interested. Great. We'll include the link to Blockchain Co-Investors in the show notes for the episode. I had a look myself and a lot of household names in there, at least from the perspective of being in this space, um, which people could sometimes take for granted, but uh, immediately recognizable to me. So, um, you know, definitely have an affinity for what you're doing there. So just to kind of kick off having a look at your 2020 predictions, I know that you did a webinar on this back in December. Uh, we'll also include the links for the webinar in the show notes. But what we wanted to do was just talk through them uh, and just kind of take that one step at a time and, and maybe add some color to them as well. Uh, so just kicking off first with number one, G7 and or EU nations will announce digital monies. You want to maybe start with that one? Sure. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, we uh, This is sort of old news now, um, and every day is seeing more and more central banks beginning to announce that they are working on digital monies of one sort or another, sovereign cryptocurrencies, if you will. Um, I think I just read an article that said 18 central banks have already announced uh, that they are working on them. And of course, China's announcement of the digital yuan is the foremost. So 
I don't think that there's anything particularly new about this announcement. It's, uh, I think it's an inevitability. And the reason why it's an inevitability is that uh, countries and companies have now begun to appreciate that digital monies can bring additional functionality and take out cost and streamline payment processes in pretty dramatic ways. And, um, and they, therefore, they're a good complement to uh, the traditional sovereign backed currencies that we've used historically. And so I feel like this is, this is not so much a prediction as, as an inevitability at this point. Yeah, I do kind of feel that as well. Uh, and just looking back at when President Xi Jinping in China uh, had his speech back in Q4 of last year, where he said the word blockchain 35 times or something like that in a three plus minute speech. Um, and there is a uh, an AI startup here in Ireland called Premind. Um, and the, the CTO of that business, Andrew Mullaney, who we've also had on the show, he and I were riffing back and forth on the topic of sentiment analysis in the media and just trying to use the speech by President Xi Jinping about blockchain and about digital yuan, as you're mentioning, and saying that the the, the Bitcoin bots, uh, those algorithmic trading programs, which we're, we're going to talk about a, a little bit later, um, basically are buying Bitcoin at mention number three of blockchain by President Xi and selling by mention number 20. Um, and that's, you know, the, 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 the amount of media attention that this is now getting never would have been imagined 10 years ago. Um, and by the fact that uh, these the sovereigns are talking about digital monies um, is adding just a huge amount more of credence to the whole uh, to the whole topic as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, oftentimes it takes a little while for established players to understand how a new technology can be applied. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the knee jerk reaction oftentimes, and I'm not just talking here about blockchain, but for example, in pharmaceuticals and life sciences, when we first introduced new technologies, uh, based upon DNA mapping and so on, um, it was true that the large pharmaceutical companies had some difficulty understanding how these new technologies would apply today. It's, it's uh, ubiquitous that healthcare and pharmaceutical companies leverage those new technologies across their business. I think we're seeing that right now in automotive, where, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the industry didn't believe alternative, ve- uh, alternative fuels and electric vehicles had any place in the automotive industry. And here we are, and everyone is on board. And I think we're going to see the same with dig- digital payments and digital assets. It's, an, it's coming fast now. And the largest governments, which is our first prediction, but also later on we'll talk about companies and banks, uh, they are now coming on board. And I think 2020 will be the year where we see governments really ramping up their interest and focus on these new technologies that uh, use the distributed ledger and blockchain uh, to affect them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So rolling forward to number two, developing nations will embrace Bitcoin. I thought that one was quite interesting. um, And I know that you had spoke specifically about Latin America, uh, but would you like to elaborate on that one a bit? Yes, thanks, Pete. So I, I think that the, the, the point here is that we have about 200 nations in the world, and most of them, not all of them, of course, but most of them do have a sovereign-backed currency. And the largest, China, the United States, the EU, which is, of course, a federation of com- uh, com- uh, countries rather than a single country, these are all going to embrace and have the the skills, the capabilities, the resources to uh, to take on board digital sovereign-backed cryptocurrencies. Um, now, obviously, there's a lot of countries in the world that don't have those capabilities and resources. And there's also a lot of countries in the world where their citizens don't trust uh, the, the, the sovereign entity, the government, if you will, to provide a reliable currency. And in fact, in this, many of these countries, uh, the experience has been that you're unwise to believe in 
and hold and use the sovereign backed currency of your country because it's not dependable. And so in that long tail, if you will, of countries around the world, um, we believe that Bitcoin will clearly represent uh, something superior to the, the, the local sovereign fiat currencies. And we doubt that some of those countries will have the ability to launch their own sovereign digital or cryptocurrencies. Um, and so in Latin America, we think Bitcoin will be the de facto answer. And a lot of people will buy and hold and trade uh, Bitcoin. And we're already beginning to see those usage curves ramping up. In Africa, we see it as a little bit more of a question mark. Uh, we think there are an awful lot of alternative payment and currency initiatives underway in Africa. BitPaser is the one everyone always talks about, but there are others too. Uh, we still think Bitcoin will probably be the leading player when the dust settles, but we'll see. And then the big wild card is India. Um, India has been very negative about Bitcoin, and we can imagine that India may in fact uh complement its biometric initiatives with some sort of digital currency initiative, but they haven't to date announced that. And we know in practice, even though it's illegal to do so, a lot of Indians are buying and holding and trading uh, Bitcoin and some of the other leading cryptocurrencies. So, and because of the scale of the country and the scale of the population, this could be an enormous uh, uh, tailwind uh, for Bitcoin and other top tier uh, distributed cryptocurrencies, but we don't quite know where India will tumble uh, at the end of the day. So that's basically the 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 prediction here is that Bitcoin will be embraced by the majority of uh, of long tail nations, if you will. Yeah, and India is quite interesting because they were probably the first large country to really adopt digital ID um, and move their population towards um, having a, a way to identify themselves outside of just a card, right? So, um, and uh, being able to transact digitally kind of goes hand in hand with being able to identify yourself digitally. Um, so I think that one, uh, in India is definitely one to watch. One other thing that this made me think of, Matthew, was you mentioned the word fiat currency, and I was in a meeting a couple of months ago with someone in the financial services community, and I said something uh, having to do with fiat currency, um, and he said, what's that? And people generally um, just you, you talk about fiat currency as traditional currency, central bank issued money, um, and it got me thinking about what does the word fiat yes. mean? And I, thought, and I thought about it from the perspective of, well, the closest thing I could think of that has to do with money that is F-I-A-T is F-E-I-T, which is the second half of the word counterfeit, right? Okay. So I thought might it have something to do with that. But no, fiat is when a government actually makes a ruling order and says something is so just because they say it is so, right? And fiat currency means, well, it's worth something just because the government that issues it says it's worth something. Yeah. Um, and that got me thinking, you know, all of this is... Um, going feels like it's going down quite an interesting track. Um, kind of the latest rhetoric out there in the market uh, in terms of um, Bitcoin as a store of value, um, as digital gold, and forget about the peer to peer electronic cash um, a payment system. That this is really about can you store value. Uh, in a way that is reliable. Now, the volatility of Bitcoin historically over the last 10 years would challenge that. Um, but as it matures, um, I think we're onto something here. I think we're definitely onto something. Yes, uh, Peter, that's very good. I agree wholeheartedly. And going back to my, the earlier point, um, when you have a new technology and it has a name, blockchain, it's easy to reject it because you don't understand it. Um, but on the other side of the coin, you know, large established companies always want to meet the needs of their customers. And uh, if they begin to understand how well-established customer needs that are not being met can be met with a new technology, then it enables them to bring that technology on board. And so going back to that automotive example, electric vehicles are easy to, to uh, ignore, but conversely, 
every automotive executive would love to have technologies that allow for a much more efficient, clean uh, uh, way to for customers to drive around, if you will. And so um, in banking and in financial services, the equivalent is that we've always wanted to apply technology to markets and to marketplaces. And we've always known that it's beneficial to be able to do transactions faster and cheaper. Uh, and those are long-term goals of the established co- companies that operate in financial services. And I think that they've now turned the corner in beginning to see that the distributed ledger can actually take out cost, can improve speed, and can make their back offices and mid offices much more efficient. And I think that was the turning point in 2019. Um, as that understanding built, I think they've now come on board and we'll see a lot more announcements and we can give examples uh, later on on this call. Excellent. I think that's a perfect lead in to point number three. And prediction number three, which is banks will offer crypto access and custody. Yes. You want to explore yes, that one? Yes, thanks, Peter. So it's it's sort of, a, as you say, it's sort of a, na- a natural consequence. If you're going to have digital... So so viewed, let's view it from an established bank's perspective if, if or an asset manager's perspective. If you went back a couple of years ago, <clears throat> I think it was uh, Larry Fink of BlackRock, which is the world's largest asset management company, who said none of my customers are asking for Bitcoin. And it was probably true, or at least the majority of his customers and the largest of his customers were not interested. Now scroll forward uh, a couple of years, and I think it's true that what asset managers, private banks, wealth managers, and so on are seeing is that an awful lot of their customers are asking the question, should we have a small allocation to some of these emerging crypto monies and crypto assets, and can you facilitate that for us? And the danger for an established company is that if it can't say yes, likely customers will go somewhere else. And those somewhere else's have been obviously Binance and Blockchain.com, Coinbase, Kraken, and so on. Now, when those other players had a few hundred thousand customers, no one cared. But once they have tens of millions of customers, and they're growing fast, then the largest banks and wealth managers and asset managers have no choice but to sit up and take notice. They don't want their customers putting some of their assets into new accounts with new players. Uh, They certainly don't want to have the millennials disengage uh, and, and go off and begin to work with new players. And so in 2019, I think many of the largest banks and wealth managers were asking the question, if we want to make uh, Bitcoin in particular available to our customers, how would we do that? I think what we're going to see in the next couple of months is a large number of banks uh, stepping up. And I use banks as sort of as, as, as the sort of umbrella term, uh, banks stepping up and saying, okay, here's now our offering. You can indeed ask us to buy on your behalf Bitcoin and a few other uh, crypto uh, crypto assets, um, and we will hold them for you and we will help you trade them. Now, in order to do that, and at its heart, they have to provide custody. And we know that crypto custody is extremely difficult, and it's very dangerous to Mm -hmm. be a crypto custodian because the world's hackers uh, come to your door. So um, in practice... I think that we'll see uh, a number of announcements. We give some examples in our webinar of some of the Swiss banks like Vontabel and Murky Bauman and Julius Baer and others who will actually now roll out uh, crypto access, but they will, in most cases, outsource the crypto custody. And outsourcing of crypto custody is a great opportunity for those companies that are very, very good at it, like the Anchorages and the S Foxes and perhaps the coins of Europe and others. Absolutely. Yeah, there's lots of interesting stuff going on in Europe on this as well. I know you mentioned Vontabel and Julius Baer, um, but seeing some whispers of what's happening at ING, um, hearing a lot about Commerce Bank, 
um, and where people seem to be starting from one side or the other. It's either the enterprise blockchain side where they're talking about security tokens and digital assets and distributed ledger in the back office, um, or they are actually um, providing services around crypto cryptocurrencies yeah. um, and providing the, the custody services for those. Um, and, you know, the, the more and more and more of this that we see, um, the more and more it enters into the discussion in the public realms. Um, and again, the more, you know, people see this as, as something real. Um, but it's, you know, the, w- one of the interesting ones that I've been keeping my eye on globally has been State Street. And just seeing them recently in the news talk about how they had put a huge project in place um, on the distributed ledger side to see if they could um, get their back office really onto a distributed ledger framework. Um, And they thought long and hard about that after doing it for a couple of years. And now they've kind of pivoted um, their their blockchain-based technology expertise into the custody side. Um, and being able to compete with what's going on at Fidelity, uh, which we can talk about as well. Um, yeah. I, I, I see this more and more, it, as you're talking about as well, in terms of um, some of these service providers acting as subcustodians, perhaps. Uh, and there are some long uh, historical examples of those happen- those types of things happening in diff- different asset classes that I think we've got some um, uh, you know, good lead-ins yeah. for. Okay, again, a good lead in. Um, we're kind of, um, uh, you know, getting a head start on each one of these topics as, as, as we finish the last one. So, number four, hybrid wallets will become available everywhere. Yeah, so, Can you dig into that yeah, one? So, a bit? the point here, Pete, is, and I'm going to probably give you slightly shorter answers because I'm also aware we're at the 20 minute mark. But um, for, for most of us, in, uh, we have to affect our financial services activities through uh, single-purpose apps today. And so we'll have our checking account app or our, you know, our uh, primary transactional account uh, app. We may have a some other payment app, a PayPal or a Venmo or something that we use. We'll typically have an asset-related account app, so a place where we go to buy and sell shares or other investment activities. Um, and, you know, all of this is quite fragmented. We may have a crypto app that we use, a Coinbase or a Kraken or something, an S-Fox. Um, <clears throat> those things are going to begin to, uh, to, to merge. And that's already occurring in Asia. So if you went to WeChat as an example, WeChat provides a breadth of functionality and enables you to transact, to invest, to borrow, to lend, all in a single app, uh, both in a traditional products way, but also uh, in a crypto crypto asset and crypto money way. So we, we anticipate that those com- more complex and hybrid apps um, that provide a breadth of financial services, products and services, and also have new forms of identity and provenance built into them are now going to be launching in 2020. And we gave an example in the webinar, but I think there's a lot of people working on this issue. And it's always been there. So if you went to a, a Revolut or a Monzo, they would say on our roadmap is to go beyond the transactional account and add other products too. They just haven't got there yet. And I think in 2020, we will see these hybrid wallets with multiple financial services products in them um, in, on every continent. Absolutely. We see Revolut doing that here with uh, being able to hold cryptocurrency um, within within their app, you know, and it, it's not technically a, a true hybrid wallet, but they're they're making this available. They're making crypto available um, with Fidelity, with from what Abby Johnson is talking about. It feels like it's going to happen with them as well. Obviously, they're starting with just Bitcoin uh, on the custody side, but um, it's, you know, the the digital asset um, evolution um, that has already started. We think yeah. that we're going to see the bigger players like Fidelity obviously plug into a heck of a lot more than just than just Bitcoin. That's right. And and in fact, there's a hierarchy to the product. So we've always known that the, the transactional account doesn't really make money. And in fact, payments shouldn't really be making money for the providers. Um, but you, it gives you privileged access to uh, to help cl- customers do other things, invest and borrow and lend. And those are very profitable products. So 
it's not a surprise that the Revoluts and Monzos and Starlings in the UK, and I'm using UK examples because I know you're based in Dublin, uh, in Ireland, but um, uh, these these players began with the transactional account as struggling to make money. But of course, the other products, when they do get turned on, are how they'll make their their offerings uh, value creating. And so we think that this is gain is an inevitability in 2020. Absolutely. And just quickly, before we move on to the next one, we see that coming from the other side with Coinbase with their debit card in the UK and where you can spend Bitcoin on your debit card or you can spend, say, USDC, uh, which is one of the stable coins that uh, they they brought to market uh, in coordination with Circle and the Center Initiative. So, you know, there's, um, you know, there's use cases here across the board that are quite interesting. Yes. The next one. Uh, number five, asset players first deploy blockchain in back offices. Want to dig into that yeah, one? Yes, so I'll be really quick on this one because I think we've pretty much covered it already. Um, when we sure. talk about asset players, we're talking about the world's largest companies who provide primarily investment products. And so this is the world of the Black Rocks and the Vanguards and the Franklin Templetons and so on. And at this point, I think all of them are working on distributed ledger technology and we anticipate that they're going to apply it first to the back office. And that means that they're really looking for efficiency. Um, and that means cost reduction, uh, uh, faster and more collaborative. And so if you went into the back office of a traditional large, uh, ETF or mutual fund company, as an example, um, they, their various departments have to use a lot of different systems to ca- gather and share data. And there's a lot of manual work that gets done. There's a lot, there may even still be paper uh, passing hands in, in the case of many uh, asset categories. As, as certainly when you move further away from public equities and fixed income, there's still an awful lot of paper in the system. And so it isn't a surprise that you're reading that HSBC is moving 20 billion dollars of assets, or pounds of assets onto their blockchain vault, I believe they're calling it, or ING is making a similar announcement, or Franklin Templeton is working on the same. Um, but it begins, for them, it begins with the back offices. And once they have efficiencies and uh, they've uh, made it easier to for people to collaborate around a specific asset, what they've also will have done is digitize the asset. And once they've digitized the asset, then they can also think about moving it into the front office, which is to say, making the digital version of the asset available through uh, traditional and new forms of distribution and channels of distribution. So this is a very important point, because if they get the back office onto blockchain, then the asset has been digitized. And if the asset's been digitized, then that opens up the front end as well. Um, but it will feel, I think, to many of us that they're still moving slowly. Um, but when you're moving billions and billions of assets uh, onto a new platform, it probably does make sense to move, uh, uh, you know, with with a certain degree of care. And um, so anyhow, I think that this is an important one. But for us who are in the world of blockchain, we will still think that they're moving slow. But for them... They're taking a giant step as they begin to put the assets onto digital indexes and digital registers. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I see a lot of this as well. And this is a one that's probably nearest and dearest to my heart with my career before I started working with startups uh, three years ago. And that just seeing the big opportunity to collapse these operational value chains. And one of the startups that I'm working with, just for the sake of transparency, I'm an advisor to fund admin chain, FAC. They are um, uh, leveraging R3's Corda to collapse the operational value chain of the investment funds industry by about 70%. So they're going to have a big impact and they've built this great um, strategic advisory group of a number of leading uh, asset managers in the UK and global market. Um, and we'll be bringing that to market this year. Um, but the point is that if you take a look at those that are the big banks that are running um, these big back offices that, um, or, or asset managers, if they're doing it themselves, 
that there's a reason that they go visit the innovation labs of Google and Amazon and all of these other big technology shops, just because when you think of those that are on the cutting edge of developing um, incredible technology, it's not generally going to be those in the back offices of banks, yeah. right? So I, they need help from the outside to do this. Um, and I wouldn't recommend that they all go off and try to do it themselves because then you're just going to end up with a huge stack of what you had before, just on a little bit better technology. And they, um, so, they do understand you know, that. So, um, you know, proprietary technology made sense when you were Citibank in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, you know, uh, most most big financial institutions outsource a large portion of their technology work today and know that they need to. And uh, by the time you get to a technology that is sort of engineered for collaboration uh, on, a, on a massive scale, then I think they also understand that it makes sense to find good partners. But, but um, it's early days as well. So we are seeing a mix of private blockchains uh, with proprietary development and open public blockchains with distributed development. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if most financial institutions begin with the former and then over time transition more to the latter. Absolutely. Absolutely. We could talk about this specific one, number five, for a very long time. Um, but I, <laughs> because, um, and I, I know there are other companies that you're advising as well, Matthew, or that you invest in, um, where some of these themes are quite relevant uh, around number five. But let's move on yeah. to number six. No ETFs, indices and funds will gather assets fast. Yes. So this is a double-edged uh, uh, sword in a way. We, you know, as you pointed out, we are investors in companies like Bitwise and in the Grayscale through DCG. And um, we like what they're doing. And we definitely, you know, Alison, my partner, um, was the former CFO of BGI, Barclays Global Investors, which launched iShares. Yep. which is today the world's largest um, provider of ETFs. So we we know that ETFs are superior to most other products, and certainly the world's investors seem to agree with that. They're low cost, and um, uh, uh, their performance tends to be better when uh, cost is taken out and reinvested in performance. So uh, we have a, an affinity for ETFs, it has to be said, Um the SEC has been pretty clear that the remaining concerns they have around ETFs are very fundamental and they go to the questions of how much of the Bitcoin trading is, is, is true and natural, v uh, fake and engineered. And, uh, it, they go to the question of price discovery, which marketplaces are setting price and which are following. And to what extent is the fake volume correlated with the price uh, setting in the Bitcoin world? Um, the problem is the questions the SEC are asking are very hard to answer. And uh, people are trying to get the information and demonstrate the veracity and the, the scale and of the good, the good portion of the Bitcoin uh, volume globally. Um, but I don't know in 2020 that they'll be able to show enough evidence to to get the SEC to approve. Now, obviously, I could be wrong on this one, and but but my intuition is probably that um, it's not going to happen in 2020. However, um, that doesn't mean that the same players, the Bitwises and the Grayscales, can't accumulate a lot of assets. And in fact, I think they already are. So what's happening is if 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 a true ETF isn't available. What's the next best, most efficient way to invest in Bitcoin other than buying and holding it in uh, yourself and being a custodian? And, um, and for most of the world's largest investors, they cannot act as self-custodian and they don't want to expose themselves to those risks. So, so vehicles that track Bitcoin or hold Bitcoin on behalf of uh, of, of uh, investors um, such as, as I mentioned, uh, Grayscale's GPTC or Bitwise's uh, funds. I think that these will continue to accumulate assets rapidly and uh, that they will be the sort of the next best thing to an ETF. 
but uh, eventually we'll have ETFs. I just don't think it'll be in 2020. Yeah, I, I I think you're right, and I don't think it's a I don't think it's a, a terribly bad thing um, if you've got vehicles and and these products that are already out there that um, you know can serve the purpose and meet the need. I I was thinking about one example from my past on where um, you know why why is the SEC um, you know not approving these things? And I thought about the depository framework. Um, in the European Union here, uh, which is basically a, a custodian plus, right? Um, and one of their roles is fiduciary. They need to prove that assets do exist and they are safe. And f- never mind, is the trading real um, or is are, are some of the prices inflated or whatever the case may be? It's just that is that custodian, which is basically a traditional bank, prepared to be able to say hand over heart that those assets do exist um, and that they are safe? Um, I had an example from years ago where um, and a, a very alternative asset manager wanted to start a powdered milk fund, um, and they had found some uh, discrepancy in the market. Um, but the depository that I was working with at the time said, no, not going to do it. it. It's too hard to prove that the powdered milk is safe. Um, and I think um, you know we're, we're still a good few years away before the traditional banks that are housing uh, these regulatory um, providers, these regulatory roles that are necessary for large scale investment funds to, uh, to invest in some right. of these assets. Um, it's going to be still a little while before they come up. Right. Uh, but and I there think we're is some, there. Uh, there is some sequencing to these predictions. So if you, if you went back, we've already talked about how big banks are going to provide crypto access and be act as custodians. And we've talked about how big asset managers are going to begin to put assets onto the chain or a chain of some sort. And we've talked about the arrival of uh, government-backed sovereign cryptocurrencies. All of these things are creating greater volume, greater liquidity, greater confidence. And I think by the time we get down to the issue of ETF, those those other predictions will begin to have a material impact. But... The specific question of how much, for example, of Bitcoin's global volume is fake and to what extent does it impact price, which are the questions the SEC is actually asking, are actually very hard to answer. And hopefully someone will answer them in 2020, but I'm not sure. Money never sleeps, pal. That does it for this week, folks. Thanks to Matthew for opening up his mind for part one of his blockchain predictions for 2020. Make sure you check back in next week for episode 72, featuring part two of this two-part feature. Links and show notes for this episode are on moneyneversleeps.ie, so check us out online. Remember, if you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it is highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com. Also, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for editing this podcast. As for me, I increase the odds of startup success. Get in touch through the contact page on norioventures.com, and you can follow Owen Fitzgerald on Twitter at Owen Fitzgerald9. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See ya! Money never sleeps, pal.